Good afternoon and welcome to the Atom Energy PLC investor presentation. Throughout the recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Olivia Massat, CEO. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much uh, for um, allowing at home to present the latest update. Um, from what I understand, there's quite a few people who are joining today. So we will go forward with the presentation. Um, and um, you, some of you who have been here for a while may have noticed um, the updated uh, logo, I guess, of uh, Atom being a representative of uh, our significant move uh, towards the fertilizer sector. Clearly, this is not the only thing that Atom will be doing, but on the near term, it is very clear to us that you know the easiest way uh, to develop green ammonia project is to be extremely focused on the fertilizer side. Um, I will now move on uh, to the next sections, which are the usual disclaimers as a public company. And um, for uh, some of the new shareholders that we have, um, so who is Atom? Right. So we are uh, we are essentially the uh, the first and only pure play developer um, listed on the uh, London Stock Exchange focus on the development of uh, green hydrogen and green ammonia. And uh, our first projects absolutely uh, going towards uh, green fertilizer. So now we have uh, three operating entities. Um, so with uh, Paraguay, um, which was the original, um, uh, which, which originated at home, um, Iceland uh, with the green fuel team, and uh, in Central America with uh, in partnership uh, with the uh, Cavendish team, uh, which leads us to a pipeline of projects of around 600 megawatt. So our first project, and I will discuss a little bit about it, is uh, the Vieta project. So 120 megawatt announced uh, with a startup date in 2025. Uh, it's the largest green ammonia project um, announced to date as far as being able to operate um, so rapidly um, in the Latin American cont continent. Um, some of you may remember, so 120 megawatt um, in, uh, enables you to produce up to 100,000 tons of green ammonia as a liquid. Um, and once you go into the uh, further process of calcium ammonium nitrate, it allows you to, to basically produce up to 250,000 tons of calcium ammonium nitrate. Um, with uh, FID uh, decision uh, now is expected uh, by September, October uh, of this year. Um, so our products, you know, obviously is 100% green, 100% using uh, renewable power. In the case of Paraguay, uh, it's obviously hydroelectric power. Um, and to give you an idea of impact, I mean, it's great to produce a product and a green product, but the consequence of having a green product um, allows us you um, to abate over 350,000 tons uh, of carbon. Um, in a market for Latin America, for example, you know, if you are going to be producing, um, when there's a yearly demand, um, you know, of um, nearly 20 million tons per year of CAN, that's a significant amount of uh, displacement that you can do in the new economy. Um, so what's what's the business? You know, how how do we produce green hydrogen, green ammonia? So going back to basics, to be able to produce green hydrogen, um, what you have is you are pretty much electrolyzing water. What does that mean? Is you use an electrolyzer, which is pretty much a, a giant electrical hammer, which takes pure water, so H2O, separates, separates the H on one side, hydrogen, and the O on the other side, oxygen. Uh, so with hydrogen, you can do a few things. Um, obviously, everybody has heard about using hydrogen um, from the mobility side with hydrogen vehicles. You know, with uh, whether it's uh, Toyota or Hyundai, uh, you, know, you can now buy hydrogen vehicles um, in your dealership. Um, but actually, with hydrogen, you can also make ammonia. You treat it as a base chemical. Um, and that's the way it has been done uh, for decades now. Um, and through the harbor wash process, you take the hydrogen, you add nitrogen, and it becomes ammonia. And ammonia, the largest use of ammonia today is in the fertilizer sector. And ammonia, you can have it in different forms, uh, whether it's calcium ammonium nitrates, ammonium sulfates, and, and you know, urea and so on. 
Um, and so what you can then do is, depending on the choice that you are going to make, um, you can go further downstream and in our particular case for Vieta, make calcium ammonium nitrate. Um, and I will go a little bit later in the presentation on explaining uh, CAN. Um, ammonia also can be used as a fuel uh, in the marine sector, which is the focus um, of our partnership with Green Fuel in Iceland. Um, the way we are developing our projects is really our own IP. Right? We don't take technology risk whatsoever. We are actually you know, very much technologically agnostic. And um, the fact that we are using baseload hydroelectric power allows us to be technology agnostic and use alkaline technology, which is which has been in operation for nearly a century now. Um, you have heard a number of other technologies, whether it's PEM uh, or SOEC, which are um, the newer kids on the block. Um, PEM doesn't really offer any incremental benefit on the efficiency of transforming electrons into molecules, but it is better suited when you have to deal with wind uh, and solar power, uh, which by essence is quite intermittent. Um, the other technology called SOEC, solid oxide, uh, is, is a very promising technology because it has a higher efficiency to transform electrons, electricity into molecules, uh, which will generate better returns, but this is still pretty young as a tech. So our view is we want to be as simple as possible, as focused as possible by um, buying our power from uh, existing partners for hydroelectric power in Paraguay. Um, from um, from Ande, um, which has the second largest hydrogen dam in the world, um, and use the hydrogen created to make ammonia and then attack and uh, sell our products into a market on a fast track basis. Because whilst the economy is moving extremely fast, we strongly believe that if you can get, if you can be first to market, you will be able to generate the highest returns and the highest interest. Uh, also, we are not waiting for the hydrogen market to be created or the, or the growth of hydrogen trucks uh, or the growth of the hydrogen economy in the long term. We are selling into a market which exists today, which needs the products today. Um, so this gives you a, a, a view of uh, where we are uh, today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the different partnerships on the project. In the first project in Paraguay, 120 megawatt phase one in Vieta. We are also maturing uh, another uh, project in Paraguay, which we call Phase 2 Iguazu, which will be 300 megawatt, so uh, two and a half size of the Vieta project. Um, and there we already obviously have a long-term power purchase agreement uh, with Ande. We already have our owner's engineer working with us for nearly two years now with ACOM. Um, and on the financing uh, side, we are working with uh, Natixis, uh, the French investment bank, with uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, um, which is the equivalent of the World Bank for Latin America. We have our front-end engineering and design contractors, which are Urbas and Casale, um, which are very important into putting the project together, doing all of the engineering and being able to be ready to go towards uh, the uh, EPC, so engineering and procurement, who will do the construction. Uh, the choice of Urbas and Casale was a very logical choice. You know, Urbas, with its team have developed a number of uh, projects and initiatives in hydrogen um, over the past five years in Spain, but also had developed a, a, a number of um, power projects in Latin America. So the ability and the expertise to have developed power projects in Latin America was absolutely key um, and added with Casale. Casale is one of the oldest um, fertilizer chemical company in the world. Um, they have uh, built a number of uh, ammonia and calcium ammonium nitrate plants uh, uh, across the globe. So for us, they are a perfect partner with a track record of delivery um, efficiently um, and are very well recognized within uh, the sector. And we are now nearing the end um, of the work on the environment and social impact assessment, um, where we've been very uh, happy with the work done uh, using IFC and World Bank performance standards uh, by GGP and with a uh, partnership with Nexant on the market study, because obviously we believe in the market and you can see on what is written on the press, but when you go to see to lenders and investors at the asset level, because our view is to finance all of our projects at the asset level, as in infrastructure, energy infrastructure projects, you need to be able to evidence in front of your lenders that what you are saying is true um, and able to show that you can deliver uh, on time as expected into the market. Um, so a little highlight on the progress made since the IPO. Um, so we actually, uh, we are still, um, you know, the, a, a relatively young company in an extremely fast moving sector. 
um, and uh, we listed at home in December uh, 2021. Um, and since then, we've arguably been one of the fastest growing uh, company uh, in the entire sector. Um, in here, you would have uh, seen all of the steps that we have done um, over uh, between uh, in 2022 and now in the first half of 2023. Uh, clearly, you know, although we want to grow fast, we have to be very focused on delivery because our ability to deliver Vieta on the original fast track basis will enable us to do more. Um, you see, obviously, our, our shareholder list over here on the right. Um, our original, um, we were incubated within molecular energy and uh, and spun out of molecular, which is why uh, they own 25%. Uh, Peter Levine, our chairman, owns 22%, uh, which, like me, where I'm 3.9%, we have bought our shares at the IPO and then followed our money at every single capital raise. Um, and uh, we are welcoming this week uh, Baker Hughes as a new significant uh, investor. And I will uh, go in on the next page to explain uh, the thesis behind the transaction. And you see the other shareholders that we have uh, between Traffic Garage, Schroders, uh, Clean for Hydrogen. Um, so Baker Hughes was quite a, a fundamental and an important step uh, in our growth. Um, we had been discussing with Baker Hughes for quite a number of months now as we had started front-end engineering and design for our project. So there are a limited number of global engineering companies who can deliver hydrogen compressors. Um, and Baker Hughes is actually one of them. So Baker Hughes may be you know, better known for its work in the oil and gas side, uh, but they had increasingly uh, been working um, on, the, uh, on the wider energy sector. And some of their energy compressors are, and hydrogen compressors are second to none. Uh, obviously, it's a twenty-eight billion dollar company. Uh, you know, it's a great partner to have, and for us, it's a great uh, recognition that what we are doing is being recognized by the industry, and and the industry want to follow us, um, as they want also to take leadership because whoever can deliver the first projects will then have a, a, a significant advantage to win following contracts. Um, we put on this slide uh, some examples of of the work that um, Baker Hughes has done in the hydrogen space. Um, you know, they announced just a couple of weeks ago a, a cooperation uh, with uh, ADNOC, uh, the Abu, Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, uh, towards advancing hydrogen. Um, but also, uh, they are uh, one of the uh, original participants into the High 24 uh, private equity fund, uh, which was which raised two billion two billion euros and is the largest PE fund uh, focused towards hydrogen projects. So. Um, in exchange of their investment, they have a right of first offer on uh, on our projects to be able to supply compressors, which obviously, from on one hand, um, enables us to have a very active dialogue uh, with Baker Hughes to make sure that uh, we are right sizing the project and right sizing all of the equipment, including the compressors, which is a significant uh, part of any project. But also because again, it's a right of first offer, it ensures that we have a competitive pricing um, at every single point in time. So um, a, a quick resume on, on our team. Um, I mentioned Peter earlier, and um, obviously Peter being you know, the founder of the company um, has a significant track record of delivering projects and companies uh, across the energy space. You know, he is uh, best known uh, for his uh, successful creation and exit of Imperial Energy uh, for over $2 billion uh, back in 2009. But very importantly, you know, he was also chairman of a number of, of steel and engineering companies. We have to be extremely realistic that and no matter what people say, you know, when you look in, when you work in hydrogen and in ammonia, it's, you know, some people think it's tech and it's absolutely not tech. It, it, it's, it's the chemical game. It's a margins game. So the focus on cost is absolutely clear and, and the focus on delivery and timeline is absolutely clear. So, and Peter provides us with that guidance to continue pushing into the right direction. Um, so in my uh, experience, you know, I started as an engineer in the power sector with an offshoot of GE, then moved into the oil and gas engineering side uh, with Schlumberger. Uh, but for the past 15 years, I've been on the financing side of the equation, investing across debt and equity um, across the sectors. Um, and uh, it is when I was over the past nine years at, at the IFC, uh, that working and investing in, in former companies of Peter, that, that the hydrogen strategy was really pushed and, and, and devised. And the idea is clearly for us to have the benefit of the UK listing uh, to be able to accelerate our projects um, and, then, and then 
provide and put together the financing to invest at the asset level, because really this is where you have the widest amount of financing available. So clearly having an LSE listing gives you a lot of leverage to ensure that you can get the best term when you will be financing uh, the assets. Uh, we're, we also uh, wouldn't be here without a great team on the ground, you know, whether it's in Paraguay, in Iceland or, or in Central America in Costa Rica. Uh, and, and Jim Spaulding, is, is, uh, as president of Atom Paraguay, is absolutely key as well. His experience is second to none. Uh, he used to be the head of the Taipu Dam, which provides us uh, with the electricity. Um, he was also a uh, minister and representative on the, uh, on the board of the World Bank and the IDB. Um, and his uh, last uh, public work was actually working on the decarbonization strategy of Paraguay and Ande. And this is really when the opportunity to use Paraguay's excess power to help decarbonize the country further, uh, but also create a new industry within Paraguay, which will add value not only in the country, but in the region, uh, uh, became really uh, real and he's able to help us deliver it. Um, obviously, we need the other side of the expertise, which is our long term, long standing hydrogen expertise, which is where Mary Rose comes in. Uh, you know, for over 50 years, she was the head of the International Energy Agency's Hydrogen Unit. Um, and so she has longstanding experience into help is, you know, helping us guide with the right people, with the right, uh, with the right industries. Um, and, and of course, you know, questioning a lot of the technology because there's a lot of things being said, but you really have to get under, uh, you know, under the brochure to see where is the reality and who has been delivering and who has not. Um, and the most recent hire into the team has been Terry Bakken, um, because we have, you know, done the, the engineering of the project. We are putting the financing together, and, and it's only at the point where we really understood where the power comes from, where we're going to build the projects, where are we going next. Well, now we have to work very hard on the uptake side. Um, and, and Terry uh, is, you know, he used to be VP, a uh, senior VP of uh, ammonia and fertilizers at Yara, one of the largest company, fertilizer companies in the world, and also had the same one within Eurochem. Um, so actually, you know, Terry and I just came back from the International Fertilizer Week, um, which was held in Prague this week. This is the largest global uh, conference on fertilizers, uh, where we met, let's say, everybody who we need to speak to. Uh, to ensure that uh, we can look for the uh, best possible marketing agreement um, to uh, to uptake the the uh, ammonia and the calcium ammonium nitrate CAN uh, from Vieta. Uh, and this now I will we'll go very briefly into the sector and just show you how how fast this sector has been moving. And we are really moving from a tech focused sector to a delivery side. Um, and in this, you see in the press, you know, what has happened since the beginning of the year, um, you know, everybody or most people have heard about uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, in the US, um, which is pushing extremely hard and extremely fast uh, the new technologies of decarbonization of hydrogen, of renewable power into the US. Um, how, you know, even BMW is also has just unveiled this week a new, uh, a new hydrogen car. Um, and what has been um, two, I mean, three fundamental events of the past month and a half. Um, so, number one, the International Maritime Organization has really stepped up to the plate as far as pushing um, the regulation to enable using, um, well, pretty much e-fuel with ammonia uh, front and center into the shipping sector as the best way to uh, ensure zero carbon shipping. Um, we have also seen the food groups, you know, OCI, OCP, the fertilizer manufacturers, um, starting to now actively look for and purchase green fertilizers um, as they have, as they want to create more independence uh, towards uh, the oil and gas value chain, which on, on is obviously highly carbonated uh, into the production of fertilizers, uh, but also uh, can lead to a lot of uh, a lot of issues as we have recently seen uh, between Russia um, and, and Ukraine, where the uh, flow of uh, fertilizer just stopped. Um, and finally, um, one of the first large project, green ammonia project, uh, has now reached final investment decision. Um, and that was developed in Saudi uh, Arabia with Noam, uh, Aqua uh, and Air Products, um, which have uh, they have raised eight, eight and a half billion dollars to finance their project. 
uh, which will be in operation over the next five years. So it's obviously it's a much bigger project than what they are doing, but but we are doing. Sorry, um, but uh, and it will be delivered quite a little later than us. Um, but it gives us full confidence that we are going exactly the right direction in a market which is maturing extremely fast. Um, so as as for a quick reminder on you know what is green hydrogen, you know I mentioned earlier what what how do you make hydrogen, but also the different markets that hydrogen can go for, and it really has the big advantage that electrification will only go would only take us so far. You know there's a very good reason why even in London we have electric buses and we have hydrogen buses. It's because you need the molecules, you need to have energy in molecules to give you that flexibility and have zero carbon uh, hydrogen molecules. And more and more now that hydrogen, as we discussed earlier, you know, ammonia is by far the largest market at scale to use that hydrogen. Um, and then soon enough, it will be it will be followed, you know, between transport, power generation, um, and also the able, ability to use uh, green ammonia to transport hydrogen over long distances. Um, but our focus, as I mentioned, you know, has really been a very pragmatic focus, which is in today's world, if I'm going to be producing hydrogen. You know, I need to find a market. That market is ammonia, green ammonia. And what is the biggest market in green ammonia? Again, it is the fertilizer world, right? And, and it is quite important to continue focusing on that because this is an industry which has been relatively quiet over the past, over the past years, but it's just as big as the oil and gas industry. But ammonia alone, we're looking at about 180 million tons a year. You know, it's a globally traded commodity. But 95% of it comes from hydrocarbon, from natural gas, from coal. So the uh, the importance uh, to go and obviously uh, decarbonize these fertilizers, because for about for one ton uh, of ammonia coming from natural gas, it will generate around two tons of carbon. That's a very clear impetus on climate. The other side is the industry is also very realistic that the amount of funding to be able, and the ability to develop new oil and gas projects or new coal project is fast coming down. Um, and as we have seen uh, with the price of gas going uh, significantly higher over the past two years and the availability of natural gas has become an issue, um, you need to find alternatives uh, if you want to be able to feed a world which is growing by about a billion people every single 10 years, uh, which is where green hydrogen and green ammonia um, plays an absolute key, uh, key role. Um, on this slide, we show a little graph on the right coming from the International Fertilizer Association, and it shows you um, how the speed at which uh, the fertilizer you use is growing, because we only have a limited amount of land globally to feed a growing number of people. Um, so you see in 2021, 2022, has the demand has come down, and it has come down sharply because of two things. Right? Number one, um, clearly, as the price of fertilizers went up, uh, people were less able to buy fertilizers and farmers were really in a pinch. Um, and of course, you know, there's the element of COVID attached to it, but that that demand is rebounding extremely quickly. Um, the, as we were mentioning, of, of course, you know, as you look at ammonia across the world, across the stream, you know, what are we looking at? Um, the thing is that ammonia based fertilizer um, pretty much uh, feed half of the world today. Um, there's a lot of talk around organic fertilizers, but the reality is if you want to do things at scale and growing, uh, the ammonia-based fertilizers are absolutely the key to do things. But as I mentioned earlier, it is also the highest carbon emitting uh, fertilizer sector that you can have. So the ability to do it green solves that problem. Um, you are, and obviously, we are looking also you know, at a demand which is extremely growing, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you want to feed a growing world rapidly, um, you know, the ammonia based fertilizers, so nitrates fertilizers are there. Um, the, uh, and within all of the products that you can make with ammonia, calcium ammonium nitrate is actually the fastest growing one. Uh, today, the largest ammonia based fertilizer that is, that, that is being used is urea. Uh, it's because it's flexible, it's very well understood, it's, it's been used for, for decades, uh, but the problem with urea, it has the highest carbon content of all fertilizers, because to do urea, you pretty much mix nitrates, so um, you use ammonia, and then you add CO2 uh, into it to be able to, to disperse into the field, and basically the CO2 is, is the medium. Um, calcium ammonium nitrate, uh, pretty much what we use is, is we use um, you know, calcium rocks, dolomites, 
that we mix with the uh, um, ammonium nitrate solution. So it's a, it's a zero carbon uh, fertilizer, which has uh, better properties um, than urea. And, it's, and, it's, uh, and the advantage that it has is that it is also a lot more flexible and a lot easier to transport globally. So when we were looking at when we were doing the production and putting the design uh, of, of the plant of Vieta, one of the first meetings that we had when Terry joined us um, was that, well, I completely understand what you are doing with ammonia. I really understand the whole thesis, but reality, the, the, the fertilizer world uh, will put a huge premium if we could produce calcium ammonium nitrate. Um, and because this, would, this is an end product that they can use right away very quickly, and because this is pretty much you sell it in, in, in very large bags, right? It becomes a powder uh, and it's an inert powder. You know, there are zero, uh, zero handling uh, or safety issues, uh, or very limited one attached to, uh, attached to handling uh, CAN. Um, this is also uh, the cheapest on the logistics. So whilst clearly the regional market of Mercosur, so which is, uh, which is Paraguay, Argentina, uh, Brazil, which is our market, uh, is very large already. You know, we're talking over a million ton uh, a year of demand. Um, you can actually very easily uh, ship it into Europe, uh, which is which is over 10 million tons a year of demand and growing extremely fast. Um, so as far as scaling up uh, the project, you know, as I mentioned, Vieta, we are we are going full speed ahead uh, in order uh, to reach FID uh, by uh, September October. Uh, and from then on, uh, we will, it will take uh, about 28 months uh, to, uh, to, con to complete the building of a facility, to complete the commissioning and to have the startup uh, and to be in production, uh, starting up production in 25 and delivering very quickly. Um, as we have, we actually started clearing the land um, to prepare for the, uh, for the, um, sorry for piling the land for preparing the land because obviously this is uh, there's going to be a lot of equipment uh, being put uh, as we start ordering uh, by the end of this year uh, and in parallel of uh, obviously delivering vieta you know you would expect that by by the end of june we will have the investment memorandum ready uh, to send to the uh, lenders and asset level investors via Netixis um, and uh, idb's uh, work um, and we will also have very advanced, uh, we will advance, sorry, our discussions with the off-takers uh, to choose our marketing partner over the next couple of months. So that's as, that is the type of an announcements you can expect from the Vieta projects. Um, I mentioned Iguazu, um, also in Paraguay, that's the, the second largest phase. Um, we are obviously in advanced discussion and we continue to discuss uh, with Ande. Um, we are very happy with the way things uh, have been going. It's a real partnership that we have with Ande and I think it's, um, you know, we are seeing them deliver in Paraguay, increasing the capacity of the grid um, to in, in order to enable uh, large projects like ours and uh, use domestic electricity for the benefit uh, of the country and create more jobs. Um, and of course, the last point that we have um, is the uh, much smaller uh, mobility project that we have. We're talking uh, a, a megawatt of electrolyzers. Um, and this particular one is in partnership, obviously, with CPH2, uh, which we are uh, continuing to mature and, and we'll be deploying by the end of this year. Um, when it comes to uh, Iceland and Costa Rica, you know, compared to our original um, timelines, Iceland has gone a little slower than expected. You know, as I mentioned a number of times, um, we, uh, the country has not been immune from the, cri from the energy crisis in Europe, uh, but we announced a couple of, a couple of weeks ago um, that both uh, HSRK and ON had signed up to a total of 60 megawatt of power capacity um, available uh, from 26 onwards. Um, and um, we had, uh, in partnership with Cavendish, set up the National Ammonia Corporation, uh, where we are pushing ahead uh, to mature our first project, which we hope we'll be able to announce uh, in the next couple of months. Um, we've been looking at other geographies um, and we've learned quite a few interesting things. Obviously, the main thing is we are confirmed that we are one of the lowest cost projects globally. Um, and that's great. But as I say, we have to deliver and we are absolutely focused on delivery uh, because this is what will bring the most value to shareholders once they are once we are able to prove uh, to the market, to the industrial partners, to the off takers. 
um, that at home was right earlier than anybody else um, and will be able to deliver more value uh, than anybody else. Uh, so with with that said, I think I will move uh, to the Q&A uh, now. Olivia, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. But just while Olivia takes a few moments to review those questions that have been submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Olivia, as you can see, I've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And if I could just ask you to read out those questions and give responses where it is appropriate to do so, yes. I'll pick up from you at the end. Uh, thank you very much. We, um, I think I'll start with a pre-submitted question, uh, which was, has the company taken um, a few on available electrolyzers and specifically for current projects. So are we looking at alkaline, uh, PEM, uh, solid oxide? So uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, our focus is really to be low technology for our large projects. We will not take any technology whatsoever. So alkaline um, is the one um, that we are choosing. We've actually spent and we did a little bit of a, an RFP slash beauty contest um, in, as part of a front end engineering and design. And um, whilst we had, uh, we didn't want to entertain offers from for on PEM, uh, a number of suppliers did uh, did offer it as a possibility, and it confirmed two things to us, um, which is obviously we did not need uh, PEM, um, although they have you know very uh, the track record for PEM is growing extremely fast. As I say, the efficiency and uh, the efficiency uh, advantage um, is not is not uh, relevant to us in our base load hydraulic power. Um, and also the fact that um, the track record uh, at very large scale wasn't long enough for us. Right? Our view is simplicity in everything we do, uh, which is why we went to CAN as, as an end product for Vieta. It is the easiest product to place. It's the easiest to add product to identify a green premium. And with alkaline electrolyzers, it's the same as well today. If you can use alkaline electrolyzers, use alkaline electrolyzers because you have a track record, you are able to see um, and audit the operations of other large scale uh, projects uh, on alkaline. Um, are, am, I dim am I dismissing PEM or SOEC? Absolutely not. Uh, I think for our future projects, we will absolutely you know, look, look, uh, look at uh, uh, sourcing if, if needed. Um, at this point in time, as I mentioned, I think SOEC seems to have the, uh, the highest potential because it will, it will be the one which gives the most value if it is 20% more efficient uh, to change electrons into molecules of hydrogen. It means that you will have 20% more money uh, on the back end uh, for you. Um, the, uh, on the mobility project, uh, as, we, uh, as we discussed last year, and um, we had been working with CPH2, Obviously, this is a much smaller scale. Um, for us, we see that mobility gives us a great optionality for the future. And, and, and we saw that the partnership for CPH2 um, in working into a small scale mobility project uh, made a lot of sense. Um, obviously, we have we both our companies with Yorkshire Roots. So it made a lot of sense for us to mature uh, a project which, which is a little bit of a demo project at this particular stage, but has a lot of potential to grow in the future at a very low capital exposure. Um, I will move on to the next question, um, which is, uh, is High24 a future potential investor into the company since Baker Hughes is about to become a shareholder? So Baker Hughes is a shareholder uh, on both. Um, and uh, and we have had you know good discussions with High24. I mean, this is, but like we have had good discussions with absolutely everybody. Um, so, uh, so we can hope that High24 would like to come into our projects. Um, it's, uh, I think for us, you know, we, we, will, we want to have the right partners, um, but also we want to make sure that these partners are the right partners on the technical side, that they can add something, not just their money, um, and that they have also the same vision as us. So this will be the work over the summer um, to decide who we want to work with in our first project uh, and, uh, you know, as we talk to the market, I certainly hope that I24 will be very active in this discussion. It's a great fund made by a number of you know, very, very competent people. And, um, and we will see as, uh, as negotiations uh, continue and as we try to find the best partners to enhance the value of the project. But of course, as us as shareholders, as I mentioned, 
um, you know, the entire management came in at the same time as anybody else. So we are all extremely motivated to make sure that we find the right partners and the partners which gives us the most value. Um, then a question from Mark, when do we expect to close the financing on Vieta? Uh, do finance partners accept at home to raise additional equity as part of the project finance? Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we certainly hope to be in a position to close the financing at FID, so September, October. And this is why we hired Netixis um, on, on NIDB, right? We, uh, the whole game in there, and that's the whole infrastructure financing game, is to be able to optimize asset level financing, um, investors coming into the assets. You know, you, if you look at uh, the old oil and gas model, uh, of maturing uh, projects which look too risky for the majors and then when you mature it when you get them to FID you do a farm out at the asset level so that you minimize the equity that we as Atom would have to put in to the project but obviously keep the lion's share. Um, the other side of being a listed company also gives us more leverage to be able to ensure that we get the most value at the asset level um, because there may be cases where raising a bit of money at the PLC would make a lot of sense. Um, our view also with the PLC has also was always that um, you, you get most diluted during the period we are in, which is the pre-FID period. This is where money tends to be the most expensive and some of the funds, uh, some of the large funds would actually charge you the most for it. So uh, being able to, to do what we do uh, through the listing, through our very supportive shareholders enables us to raise and to create a lot more, um, let's say to, to raise our profile um, and, and to give us a lot more leverage vis-a-vis -vis the asset uh, investor levels. Um, then I look at a question from Sam W. Uh, two questions, the relationship between BH and Baker Hughes and access to hydrogen compressors. Does it cover Iceland and Costa Rica in addition to Paraguay? And is the production of CAN uh, the long-term plan in Costa Rica? So it's, it's, it's a corporate relationship that we have uh, with Baker Hughes. And, and it's not, as, as, as I mentioned, it's not an obligation uh, to work and to, to take uh, Baker Hughes compressors if they don't fit the particular project. But it really is, you have to see it as a partnership. Um, and the other side is, uh, is the production of CAN, the long-term plan for Costa Rica or Central America. Each country is different, you know, they, they, and each country needs different types of fertilizers. So we always look for what is the best thing for each project. While CAN is the best thing for Vieta in Paraguay, um, CAN may not be the best product, uh, product for Iguazu, for example. So that gets matured as you mature the project, as you talk to the market, and the CAN, the choice, the, the choice that, uh, that we made to go towards CAN was in discussion with Terry, but also, of course, all of the off-takers. You know, we don't take decisions in isolation. We always want to put and to sell what the market wants. We don't want to uh, we don't want to push something that the market is not ready to take. And this is both a question of a regional market, but of course a global market. Um, and then I have uh, another question: How competitive is your green product? Are you already seeing interest in green fertilizer from the agri and food companies? Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, we just came back from the IFA conference. Uh, and it was one of the very large themes of the conference. And what we are seeing is this is this is growing extremely rapidly. And this is pushed both by the fertilizer companies, but especially the food companies. You may have seen in Europe now, every single food product is going to get an environmental rating, whether it's A, B, C, D. Um, and we have seen already evidence that, for example, there's been a, a drastic slowdown in the sale of meat uh, in, in Germany, for example, when people saw the carbon footprint of meat. So the food industry knows that it's coming and they, if they want to be able to keep their, let's say, the social license to continue to operate, what happened to the oil and gas sector 10 years ago is starting to happen into the fertilizer sector. So, uh, and the sector also understands that, yes, there is a little bit of a premium, but the cost of fertilizer, whether it's in sugar uh, or cocoa or potatoes, is not high compared to the cost of the end product. Uh, so it means going green uh, fast uh, is actually a lot easier than what people are saying. And are we seeing some premium today? Yes, we are. It kind of depends. But there's also one big thing that we have to keep in mind is the carbon border mechanisms which are now being created. And, um, and this is where we will be in a great position because um, if we were to take ammonia alone, 
um, if we assume that the C bands that which will be starting to be enforced from 2026 onwards um, works is true. Uh, well, the reality is, as I mentioned earlier, one ton of ammonia is two ton of carbon. Two tons of carbon would cost about two hundred dollars a ton. Right, so um, so that gives you a physical, I mean, a, a logistical and a commercial advantage uh, to produce uh, green uh, versus gray imports, which will be highly taxed. Um, another question: Do you intend to supply the local market, or could you look further to Europe? Um, well, as I mentioned, um, we have. Uh, you know, we have indeed looked at the entire market and our focus in every country we work with it's a partnership with a, with a host country which is why we have teams on the ground um, which are real partners um, like uh, the team of cavendish uh, like uh, like the team of greenfield who understands the local side it's not you know we don't do things just for exports right this is not the way to develop projects these are these are facilities which will be here for the next 40 years, right? This is not 10 year and then you move on and you have a declining asset. These projects, once they are running, they will be, they will be running at 97, 98% capacity flat for 40 years. So you need to look at it as a local partnership where your first project, your first market is the local market. And very quickly, you look at the regional side and then you look at the international side. The domestic and regional market of Mercosur is a great market because it's a market which has to import everything. So logistically, we already are uh, and can be cheaper than any import, including the gray hydrocarbon based import. So that's fantastic. But when you have uh, markets like Europe um, and even like Asia, which increasingly need more and more fertilizers and need more green fertilizer with higher taxes, um, it is uh, it is absolutely crucial um, that uh, we are able to export and being able to do CA in Vieta makes it extremely easy for us to go all the way to Europe, where there is already a uh, a green premium market that exists. It's still quite niche, but it's growing extremely fast, and we have had some incoming uh, from some of takers. Um, Another question, I see from Mike, uh, has Atom considered any partnerships with other companies or industries in Paraguay to accelerate infrastructure build uh, and cost? So uh, we, we talk obviously to, to the entire markets and, and we try to find the right partners for us uh, across, uh, across the level, right? So whether it's uh, in Paraguay alone, uh, yes, you know, obviously the team between uh, Jim and Juan Pablo uh, know most of the market over there most of the engineering firms um clearly it's it's not just about having international companies coming in and then leaving it's about uh, local content uh, we have we are also on the electric electromechanical study um, that we did uh, for example that was done with the local companies so indeed you know we as i say we don't work in isolation uh, we don't fly in and fly out uh, it's all about making sure well so we find the right people on the ground because it just makes sense on the long term but it makes business sense right it is much cheaper to use very good qualified local labor than flying somebody from houston uh, or london or anywhere else um and uh, another question from mike uh, will 300 megawatts for iguasu project also come from itaipu or is it a new project so no it um and it's one thing i, I could have highlighted earlier that obviously uh, I, I forgot to say it now, but um, Itaipu is the second largest hydroelectric dam in the world. It's 14 gigawatt. Um, and this is jointly owned between Brazil and Paraguay. So which means seven gigawatt to Brazil, seven gigawatt to Paraguay. But out of, out of that seven gigawatt net to Paraguay, Paraguay actually only use about two to three gigawatt and exports and has been exporting for the past 40 years that power into Brazil at a, at a pre-agreed price, which is obviously pretty low. Um, so it's all about using that excess power, which currently is exported, and to use it for domestic purposes and upgrade it uh, into a higher end product for the country. And Paraguay has three, uh, three hydroelectric plants. It's 100% green, a green grid. So uh, we are looking at uh, leveraging dom these domestic electrons. You know, clearly, you're not going to do gigawatt projects in Paraguay. That is not the intention. Um, and that would also would not be right with Ande as they need to build the rest of the capacity for the country. 
uh, but uh, we are working completely within uh, what is possible without ask, having to ask and they to incur any new investments and leveraging um, exact you know the the best uh, um, the best power available today globally at some, one of the best price globally. Um, and I have one last question from David. Globally, a lot of the larger projects that have MOUs or agreements don't seem to be spending money. Are some of these green hydrogens going to be delayed? Um, so yes, you know we we do see that you know historically, or at least for the past two years, the hydrogen and ammonia world has been the land of MOUs. A lot of announcements, um, a lot of noise in the press, which sounds great, which sounds great, which looks great for people to take pictures. Uh, but not a lot of reality behind, even with the large investors. And actually, you know, the, the way we started the company was the realization that a number of very large companies were studying and looking, but very few people were putting their money with their mouthpiece, including the very large companies. Um, so the IRA in the US has accelerated things significantly. And so we are seeing the US taking a real leadership in moving forward. Um, and this, this is the region where you will see um, a lot of the uh, positive movement, but it will be you know, the usual industries, you know, let's say the, the mosaics, the CF industries in collaboration with Exxon um, and, and, and others. Um, but otherwise, you know, Europe has been delayed because uh, even though you have announcement and you have a lot of subsidies which are supposedly available, you know, from the moment you make your application for a subsidy until the moment you actually have the money in the bank, it can take up to three years, right? So as a developer, it takes a lot of time. If you look at the UK example, if I were to do a new um, wind farm um, to connect it to a hydrogen and hydrogen to ammonia project, the permitting takes almost 10 years. Um, the, uh, the other side is a lot of projects are looking for perfection because their cost of power is so high that no matter how much the amount of subsidies that you have, if you are paying $150 a megawatt hour uh, for your power, it makes zero sense to start up an electrolyzer, right? So it does make sense if you are you know, below $50, but at the current prices uh, and at the expected prices, because yes, the gas powers is the gas price is very low today, but it's expected to go back up in the winter um, should a cold season materialize. Again, it makes no economical sense. So a lot of these projects have been delayed, whilst a lot of capacity has been built into manufacturing of electrolyzers, for example, um, which for us puts us into a great position because we are in a position, thanks to our advantageous position in the country, uh, between having base load power from Monday and a competitive cost, which is a regulated cost uh, in the country, um, enables us to move fast, faster, and uh, and gives us an arbitrage that you have a number of projects which have been on hold and you have a number of uh, EPC procurement, engineering companies, electrolyzer manufacturers who had built capacity, but don't have an outlet of sale, um, which is obviously for us, it puts us into a very strong advantage to deliver uh, at a lower cost than what everybody else has been looking at and deliver faster uh, than what any other competition is looking at. And which is why, uh, the uh, industrial and fertilizer sector is taking us very seriously. And this is also why Baker Hughes came in as an investor, it's because they have seen every single project in the world and they know where do we sit in that merit order and how quickly Atom has been moving compared to the entire competition. So I think I'm done with all of the Q&A. Uh, Olivia, yes, yes, I think you actually managed to address every question from investors. And of course, the company will review all questions submitted today and we'll publish those on the, the Investor Meet Company platform. But perhaps just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is very important to yourself, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Uh, so I think the, the, the closing comment uh, I will make is, um, first of all, to thank uh, our shareholders. Um, the, we've been, uh, I think, very encouraged by the support that we have had so far. And obviously, this is all both new shareholders and, and all shareholders. Um, we have... Uh, we are moving, you know, Atom is moving, moving fast. We will continue to move fast, but always in a very methodical way. So expect us to continue to develop projects the same way you develop very boring infrastructure projects, which are step by step. Um, and, uh, and we don't want to do too much. We do what is necessary to be credible. Uh, and so that the market can see that, you know, we are trying our best to deliver on time, on budget. 
Um, and I think I'll, I'll leave with a, a little bit of a marketing blurb, you know, now that we're going to do CAN. Um, and as we talk to the fertilizer market, they say, you know, you know can you deliver uh, CAN? And the answer is yes, we can. Thank you. Olivia, thank you very much for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Atom Energy PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.